So, Mark is writing for a church that's getting squeezed. There are church, there are people who are under pressure. They've, as it were, got persecuting Jews on the one side, lacking power, but not lacking in venom. And they've got persecuting Romans on the other side of them, and they're living in Rome. Romans lacking a sense of personal security, because the empire's now grown far too big for its own boots. Because uh, lines of communication, logistics, is overstretched in trying to run an empire. There's a huge slave population in Rome that they're all looking over their shoulders at and thinking a slave revolt could finish the whole deal from the centre outwards. And then they've got the pressure of meeting the aspirations of returned and retired legionaries who now need land and so on. They've got the power, but then they feel insecure in that. So you've got venomous Jews on one side with no power, leaders of the Jews there then in that time, and you've got insecure Romans on the other side with all the power and the Christians are kind of stuck in the middle. The Christians who refuse to make the sacrifices to the Roman gods and are therefore seen as not cooperating with the social cement that was being used to stick the empire together. Making Romans feel even more secure about them than they were before. And Mark, who is writing for believers in Rome, is writing for people who are increasingly marginalised in these circumstances, criticised and taking flack. And the question that he's addressing in this part of Mark's Gospel, Mark 9, 1 to 13, is how do you keep going, following the Lord, under pressure? Jesus addressed that question for his disciples because he foresaw it, both for them and for those who would come after them. And it's a lot to do, the answer to that issue, how do you keep going under pressure? It's a lot to do with where you fix your gaze. What's this verse all about? And he said to them, chapter 9, verse 1, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. What's that all about? What is this all about? It's about guarding the vision that you will need to persevere. What are you setting your eyes on? Are you struggling with persevering? in following this Jesus. What are you fixing your gaze upon? What do you see? Mark conceived of this incident with the transfiguration, as we call it, of Jesus. So that Jesus appeared before them in, in divine heavenly glory. Mark conceived it as the reminder that whilst Jesus looks humiliated now, whilst following him looks like being on a hiding to nothing now, whilst they are humiliated now as they follow him in the here and now, he and they both are in reality citizens of heavenly glory. Where will you fix your gaze? See, there's this ambiguity in the Christian's experience of his Messiah. And our own experience of life as his followers. He is glorious, but we experience life like this. And following him seems to hurt. He's told us about that. And he's showed us what we need to be looking at by telling us this story of the transfiguration. We need to set against the things we experience, the things we know to be true in eternity. So three of these disciples then are going to actually see how it really is. Some who are standing here, there were going to be three of them, will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Jesus started off this gospel in that way. Mark chapter 1 verse 15, he set out his agenda. Repent, he said, because, why, the kingdom of God is here. Here it is. And then he's gone on and he's shown them that he is the king over the kingdom. Up to chapter 8, verse 38-ish. And there comes the realisation. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say this, some say that. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, says Peter. Fantastic. Truly, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And immediately Jesus begins to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer. Must be rejected. Must suffer. Must be killed. And on the third day rise again. And immediately Peter can't cope with that because his expectation of the Messiah and his expectation of the way of salvation is we're going to win. Yeah, you are. But it's not going to always feel like that along the way. And so following that experience, following that impartation of understanding which hasn't dawned on them yet, to help them persevere following a suffering Messiah in a fallen world, they get this vision in the transfiguration of Jesus as he is, heavenly glorious. And for those days when you have to reckon with following the Messiah being heavy going in a fallen world, there's where you fix your gaze. Mark seems to be telling these Christians in Rome. Does that make sense? Keep your eyes on Jesus, says the author to the Hebrews. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And that's basically what we've got going on with the transfiguration. 